Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to AgriFood Conversations, brought to you by iSelect Fund, the Van Trump Report, the Yield Lab Institute, and Family Farms Group. My name is Tom Bunn. I'm an associate on the iSelect Fund Ventures team, and I'm excited to welcome you all to our discussion today. As you know, AgriFood Conversations is all about driving innovation in ag. Each month, we highlight a specific theme, and for the month of September, we've been discussing indoor farming. Today we have an unusual and atypical uh, agri-food conversation. Uh, this will be, um, in fact, more of a conversation than, than we've had in the past. We have um, two special guests. We have Aaron Fields, the Director of Horticulture for Eden Green Technology, and Allison Kopf, CEO of Artemis, uh, one of iSelect portfolio companies. Um, so both Eden Green and Artemis are applying technology in cool ways to support the changing food system in particular in indoor ag. Um, Eden Greens is building hydroponic and vertical farming systems to combat food insecurity by growing large amounts of produce safely, locally, and at scale. Um, and Artemis is developing software, such as its market-leading enterprise cultivation management platform to help growers optimize their facilities while offering enhanced visibility and traceability along the supply chain. Um, so it should be a, a great conversation, a little bit unusual, as I mentioned. Um, before we get started, uh, we do have a quick poll question to just to get a better idea of who we have on the call today. Um, so please take a couple seconds to answer. And then um, a few uh, mandatory process comments while the, while the poll is running. We are not soliciting investment um, in any way whatsoever. This presentation is just to provide information um, to uh, all of our attendees on, on what um, Eden Green and Artemis are up to. Um, secondly, you are all on mute. However, you can use the chat window to ask a question at any time. At the end of the conversation, um, Allison will be uh, reading questions from the chat um, that both she and Aaron can take. Um, finally, this presentation is being recorded and will be available for replay. So with that, um, I'll hand it over to Allison and Aaron and uh, looking forward to the conversation. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys, and hi, everyone. Um, so. I'm really excited about this and I'm actually fired up that this is like an actual conversation for agri-food conversations and we're just going to kind of talk it out for the time that we've got. Uh, we're going to keep it super interactive so uh, you, there is a Q&A box if you have questions drop them in there I'll kind of ask them or answer them as we go um, and we'll keep sort of prompting throughout uh, the, the whole time period so feel free to ask those as we go you don't have to wait until the end. Um, Aaron, thank you for joining. So as everybody can see, Aaron is actually walking around in the farm in the greenhouse right now, which is awesome. So I think we'll start there and maybe you can just tell us a little bit about what you guys are doing at Eden Green Technology and sort of where you are right now and what, you know, what we're looking at. Thanks. Yeah, uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks for having me. Excited to be having this conversation. It's always good to talk to shop. Um, Right now, I am walking through a one-acre hydroponic cutting-edge technology greenhouse in sunny Cleburne, Texas, uh, which is where our proof of concept and prototype greenhouse is, well, where we do our R&D developing our system right now. Uh, Eden Green has its roots um, in food hunger. Um, our founders are from South Africa. They were face-to-face -face with a lot of food hunger, our food uh, hunger issues food security issues, and they wanted to devote time to creating a system that could solve that problem any place in the world. And so that's what they did. And it's made its way to uh, Texas, where we've been developing it for the last two years. That's awesome. And I know one of the things that's unique about you guys is that you're not actually producing the food, right? You're, I mean, we're in an R&D facility, but your model, your business model is really focused in around the technology side. Um, can you tell us more about one, how you came to that decision as a company, because I think a lot of companies right now, especially new companies coming into the market, are struggling a little bit with this to some degree. People are trying to do both of those things or one or the other. So maybe tell us a little bit about how you guys came to that decision uh, and a little bit about some of the technology that you're developing. Great. Yeah, great question. This company has definitely been an evolution and a work in progress since we started. And uh, when I came on, it was very different. We were in the produce game. We were in the clamshell game. And I've done that before, uh, but other, other uh, startups. And so I know what that's like, and it's difficult. Um, and it's, there's a lot of questions that come with labor and profitability with that. So we wanted to make that easier and profitable. And we did that 
But as we tried to fill orders and as we tried to find the right varieties and, and we started realizing that we could grow a lot of different things and our real product was our system and our technology and what we've been learning. And so we just pivoted and we became, uh, uh, our product became our technology, our greenhouse is turnkey solutions for people that want to secure their food production in any, for any entity in any market. So we spent a lot of time thinking about what that looks like and what our market is, um, processes building out so that we could answer questions for people all around the globe that want to grow their own produce. So an ideal customer for you guys would be anyone from a retailer to a government entity? Like who would be a good customer for you guys? And right. what does that process yeah. look like for working with you? Yeah, we are in talks with several different entities right now all over the globe. There are countries like a Singapore who struggle with food security that need a way to produce food for their entire population. There are food deserts in our backyard. Dallas and Fort Worth have, have large food deserts. Um, that looks like you're approaching the city itself, you know, or maybe a natural disaster hits and you don't have a way to get food to your people or your populace unless you grow it right there. And so that, those are the type of people we're looking at, cities, municipalities, uh, there are counties in the United States that are talking to us about building agri centers for their county um, to produce year round produce and milk. So people know where their food's coming from. And there's also this research angle um, we are in the hemp business a little bit. We are doing R&D with some universities. So they like applying this technology for research and development. Um, just because um, they can scale this, their production and get more out of their research in our system and maybe do it a little bit faster. And then we, you know, there's a, a military government entity that's putting these things up to help people get fresh food if, if they're serving abroad. This is something, so I've been interested in this more, I'd call it a almost more systemic approach that you're taking for a while. Um, and I think one of the big challenges that indoor ag has seen to date has been some of the high cost of getting started and also yeah. operational. You, you obviously mentioned this, like the operational cost is high. So when you think about some of these things that you are trying to tackle around these like systems improvement yeah. approach where you're thinking, you know, natural, like actually security, it sounds like a lot of, you know, sec security yeah. approach, right? How, how do you think about the cost of operating and starting up with your systems? And like, how does that work for the folks that you're working with? Yeah. And I mean, that's right to the root of it. You know, we spent two years spending a ton of money. So our clients don't have to, right. That's essentially what it was. <laughs> and I've learned a million ways not to do this, which is a great method if you have the time and money. <laughs> but um, for the most part, for me, it comes down to just processes and not, I'm a firm believer in just because you can doesn't mean you should. Mm. And I don't need to automate everything, right? People have been growing plants successfully commercially and on a large scale for a long time. And there are a lot of great companies out there that make amazing produce, right? I'm not saying that, I'm just placing that. I think that I can be more effective in a niche market. Now we've doing that. We've done that by whole process. These are old processes, but I mean, right now I'm piling through somewhere around 45,000 plant spots a week with a seven person production team. Like that's it. They can tear through this. They get everything done. That took a while, but we got there. And so it's really just going back to basics and honing your processes, what you really need to do, what's important and finding where those gaps are. Um, on top of that, there's a lot of design that we've changed. You know, what's that flow look like? And all those greenhouse concepts stay the same. All those growing concepts stay the same. The fertilizer stays the same, right? Our system in controlling a microclimate allows us to grow to scale. Our processes and people allow to do that effectively, efficiently, and at a good cost. So you guys are not, are you, you guys aren't doing the greenhouse too. Do you work with greenhouse folks or, or do you do? Oh yeah, we're, we're both. You do the greenhouse too. So I come to you, I'm a government or military, yep. you know, whatever it is, I come to you and I say, I need everything. You're yep. going to drop in. You're going to give me a greenhouse, the growing system, uh, all the mechanic, like everything within the box or do you? Everything, everything in the box. It is a modular box. Um, this is a uh, unit that. And we should clarify, Aaron, when we say box, how many acres? Like this is, these <laughs> right. are big. There you go. I was just going to get there. Yeah, exactly. So our box, our, our standard unit, um, for most profitability is 62,500 square feet to so an acre and a half. Um, now that expands, you can build four of those, you know, and have 250,000 square feet if you want. Um, each one of those modules has its own self-contained 
um, apparatus that's going to drive all of your processes, your fertigation, your water, your air control, the whole nine yards. And that we work with um, all of our vendors right now and all of our engineers that have developed that, that, that process is now in place and we are going to hopefully start building that out here in the next couple months. And so I'm excited, excited for that. But, you know, we're condensing everything in these very modular units that give you very precise control. That's awesome. And we do have some, uh, some chats here, so I'll just read them off. Um, yeah. Somebody said, Rachel said that she loves the military piece. It's the first time that she's hearing it in the vertical ag and CEA space. And, and that's, that's spot on. I think one of the challenges, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Aaron, has always been the cost of produce that military is willing to pay makes it somewhat challenging. So I don't know if you have any right. insights for folks that are thinking yeah. about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was surprised and, 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 really elevated by that. Um, when our current CEO, Eddie Vedrina, came online in January, he was inspiring with these ideas. And it really helped me, um, he helped me come out of my shell to help him grow these ideas. And so we work really well together. And he has a background in government and traveling abroad and working with, with the government and, and the military in, in lots of areas around, around the globe. And so it was immediate thought of his. And then I did some research and you know, as far back as World War II, they were growing hydroponic vegetables on the islands in the Pacific because they had to. Well, why did we stop that, right? And of course it's caught. And not only that, but the, you could go as far reaching as the skills, um, having people in the military that are able to grow, that want to learn to grow, the therapy that comes in being in a greenhouse. Like there's just far reaching implications, I think, to that. Not to mention, here's some super cost effective, healthy, fresh produce for you no matter mm -hmm. where you go, right? Yeah, 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 spot on. There's another question around um, greenhouse gas footprint or carbon footprint of the greenhouse technology mm. compared to conventional production systems. And I think yeah. this has been a conversation piece for, I mean, you and I are both been in the industry for so long now, like 10 years, 15 years at this point of which is more sustainable, what the carbon footprints looks like. Have you guys done any of the calculations yeah. on that? We haven't really focused on getting our carbon footprint down from that standpoint, but all we talk about is sustainability. This doesn't work for us unless it's sustainable. And it's, um, to me, and to me, that's sexy. If this isn't going to be environmentally friendly on to the utmost degree, I'm not interested, right? I'm very adamant about that. And so we've really worked hard to make sure that no matter where we build, um, we have implementations in place right now for the rainwater capture, which is difficult. We have implementations for solar and wind. We talk to those companies like we want to have those options for everybody. We want that to be possible and that we're there. Like we already have designs and, and deals that we can run with if we need to. And a lot of space at our farm in Cleveland, we have 59 acres we can still develop right now. And so we're really working on anything sustainable. We like to, um, one of the things, like we catch our condensate, like every, mm. everything we dehumidify in our greenhouse goes back into our system. And that's a lot when you have 200,000 plant spots filling up a greenhouse, right? Yeah. And so that's one of those just little things that, you know, you may not, you say, oh, well, that's only, you know, X percent of whatever. No, but that's a big difference. We are really doing everything we can to make sure we get the most out of this controlled environment we have. I think that's one of the benefits that we actually don't talk about enough as an industry is in a controlled environment, you actually have the ability to think about technology that's been used in so many other applications because you think about right. sustainable buildings and energy efficiency and you, you, yes, you have lights. Yes, you have, you know, energy consumption, all these things. But we also have the opportunity to think about how to optimize for broader sustainability. And we can define that however the, you know, makes sense for the industry, but you can start to think about those condensate applica you know, uh, applications and all these types of things or waste heat, renew, you know, using waste heat off of different power facilities and things like that. So it's, it's an opportunity to get innovative and think about broader applications for sustainability, yeah. which is kind of cool. I have, uh, I have the <laughs> Jacques and Eugene Van Buren, the founders of this company, Technology, um, we will go round and round because all they've done since day one is pushed me out of my comfort zone and made me think out of the box. And I am the I am the guy who just puts down every idea because I'm mean, you can't do that. You can't do that. And they're constantly <laughs> going, why, why, why? And I find myself saying, because that's not how they do it. And I go, well, that's not a very damn good reason at all. And so, <laughs> you know, let's, let's do that then. And so they'll bring up things like, well, we're going to put infrared heaters in our air handling units. I go, is that necessary? And then they'll start talking about why and how and what it's going to do and what it's going to save. And I'm like, man, it does work out okay. All right, good. So over two years, they've trained me to start getting really comfortable thinking out of the box, having been in big commercial greenhouses most of my career, 
I'm trying to do everything I can to reprogram my head a little bit. So <laughs> I love that though, because that's like spot on for startup thinking, right? It's like, yeah. how do you yeah. think about leapfrogging in a way that you probably would have said no to before? And <laughs> yeah. one of the things I think probably a lot of the folks on the call or folks who will watch later probably are in, in ag in some capacity. Um, how would you push folks, like based on what you've learned here in this operation, how would you push folks to push their thinking a little bit around innovation? Are there things that you would think about differently, you know, that if you could, if you, if you, where you feel locked in your thinking, but you would push on thinking? Yeah. So if I understand, yeah, I mean, number one, you gotta be, you gotta be a little brave. Um, and you just have to be, I mean, some of the harder parts for me have been, you know, uh, career of conventional and successful training from what I would say are not, I don't like to say old school because that's a bad connotation, but traditional growing. And so I have to be willing to tell people that have trained me or I've worked for or my colleagues to, to let them, they're going to laugh at me. They're going to think I'm insane. They're going to think I'm crazy, right? And I'm like, I'm okay with that now. Like, you probably think I'm crazy anyway. So let's just roll with that and <laughs> let me try to do something new. But you also have to let that excitement, you have to let it energize you, right? You don't have to save the world today, but you can find something that helps you save the world tomorrow. And, and I think that's important um, to build those little blocks of success up to keep you going outside of that box further and further. I love that. I love the way that you think about like innovation tomorrow is what you should be mm -hmm. thinking about and, and taking the building blocks to get there. Because I think oftentimes when you're stuck in in farming, it's hard, right? It's hard to be brave. It's hard to push the envelope because also it depends on what crop you're growing, but you may only have one season to get it right. You yeah. may only have 40 chances in your lifetime to get it right. And so it's so challenging to say, well, let me get out of my comfort zone. Let me push. But if you think about that as more of a building blocks approach to say, well, if we want to be a world apart in 40 years, it might take the mm -hmm. little steps to get there. Um, yeah. Something you said earlier that struck out with me that I loved was you don't have to automate everything. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts. I mean, especially on the technology side, but yeah. we, yeah. what should people be automating, right? Like where right. should they, and maybe where shouldn't they, like, where are people spending too much time <laughs> trying to automate that it doesn't make sense? Yeah. And so this goes into, um, uh, I will not knock anybody's method. I don't mm -hmm. have this figured out and I'm getting there, but I've seen everything from your traditional, just regular old hawking it through greenhouse to like the no touchy, don't go in that room greenhouse, right? Our grow facility. They both work, that, that, that's great. But for me, um, what I've learned is don't overthink it. And like I said, don't automate if you don't have to. Um, it's unique to everybody. Your process is just unique to everyone. This is very unique, but everyone, even if you have the exact same greenhouse size system, whatever, you're in a different climate, it's different. Everything is different and your people are different, right? And so I had to build up a, a staff here that didn't know anything about this. So you have to consider all that. But I think most of all, you have to be open to listening to your employees. Um, your people are your best asset next to your plants. Um, and they make that happen. But they're the people who do the job. They're the people who are out there every day. You have to give them the power to speak and the comfort to speak to you. So you're really learning what it takes to do this. Are you the norm? Are you the exception? Can I speed this up really? Or is this as fast as we can go? And what would make your life easier and happier to come to work and get this done faster, right? And right. sometimes that's a, a tool and sometimes that's a whole conveyor belt, right? I think, I don't have the right answer to tell you what's wrong and right, but I know that most of the decisions we made in that process have benefited us drastically. What's something that you thought you might need to automate and then it turns out you're like, no, actually my people are like, they're right, they're doing <laughs> yeah. this, they're doing this great. Um, there, there's been a cleaning process for us that wasn't considered when when this was designed and built. So um, when we talked about cleaning my actual, the, the actual plant spots, you know, we were like, um, all right, we got to automate this. This is going to be a thing. And then we started looking at timelines and energy. And I went right back to my line. Okay, just because we can do this, we made this great prototype cleaning machine extraordinaire. And you know, do we need this? And does, is it practical? And like, in the meantime, the guy that was doing my cleaning found two or three mechanisms that made him go faster. If you just give me this long, longer hose was one of them and it was really weird, um, but it worked out. Um, and then adding in another hose bid for him just made it faster. And they were super quick, easy fixes that just totally replaced that. And now he is just as fast as that machine we developed. And 
don't get complacent, right? Just because we fix that doesn't mean that that's the end of that story. <laughs> so um, constantly investigating that. But that, that's a small example of things that we looked at. Maybe it was moving the vines or do you move the people or do you move the product? That's another question we always tackle with. And I always try to approach people. And I love to play devil's advocate with everybody. And it makes them good thinkers. And so we still toss around a lot of ideas. But um, I think we'll keep doing that. And as long as we're, we're working, we'll keep doing processes like that. And that's a super good example. I think 12 years ago or so, I was working with a company and we were actually in the solar space and it was like the same exact debate where it was like, should we do automated solar panel cleaning robots right. and things? And it's like, yeah, but you could just make a longer, you know, it, you're yeah. going to clean your gutters anyway. So just make a, like <laughs> make a broom that can clean it and you'll just, just do something. Yeah. It's a lot easier <laughs> solution. Absolutely. Yeah. And we've had so many of those what I call garden shed fixes, right? Where we just like bent a rake and look at that, that we're fine. You know, for now, we're just gonna roll with that. We'll patent that later, right? <laughs> we're on the flip side is somewhere where you looked at it and you you measured it and you're like, oh yeah, this has got to be automated. You did it and you're like, this is, I mean, this is changing. Uh, yeah, okay. um, immediate, and, and this is probably commonplace, but seeding, propagation in general, yeah. um, transplanting is something we'll look into. Those are tasks that no matter what it takes, if I'm going to cut out 20,000 plant spots, I have to plant 20,000 plant spots. Yep. And I don't care who you are, especially in Texas summer, like we can't transplant our top spot after 10 a.m., right? Because even though we control our environment, it's a hot workspace out there. And things like that that you learn, you're like, okay, so now we have to really haul it. And so, but uh, seeding, um, I, will always, I fought very hard to get a seeder, um, a certain type of cedar for us with a new company mm -hmm. and I lost that battle and we cheaped out and now we're buying the better one. So I will fight that fight every time. Um, and uh, I think this happens every time though. <laughs> it does. Yeah, exactly. Right. And that's why I said it seems complex, but it's true. Like that is an easy standardized, lots of options area to improve your process and teach someone how to use the machine, right? Just knock it out and it'll Absolutely. save you days. <laughs> No, I, I think that's spot on. Anybody who is thinking about seeding, transplanting, harvesting, I mean, when you're right. thinking about, I mean, you're just, everybody's looking at your background right now when you see this many plants and if you're changing, yeah, oh, yeah. you know, if you're doing this on a regular basis, which is the advantage oh, yeah. of doing it indoors and growing something that's fast growth cycle is that you're going to be doing this all the time. It's going to be yeah. incredibly intensive. So um, yes. That's awesome. I think there's another question from Ken uh, in the questions around varieties. And I was actually going to ask this question too, oh, so I think it's question. great. Yeah. Um, and so his question is, do you look for novel varieties um, of the core uh, of the core crops that you're growing to perform better in your environment? And uh, are you breeding your own proprietary lines or are you working with some of the breeders? Oh, this is uh, such a good, fun them? question. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, great question. So I'm going to try to knock this. We've done 420 varieties, I think, in this system in general, at some capacity, <laughs> right? 90% um, are leafy greens, but we've done everything from garlic to tulips, to nasturtium to tomatoes, and you name it, right? It doesn't mean it's profitable or doable. Or it doesn't mean it's profitable or scalable. But we can do it. It works. It's just a hydroponic system. And with the structure we have, we can play around with some different varieties. Um, variety choices have been tricky, and that's a great question. So I work with four seed companies, um, two of which I worked with for a long time and two that I'm kind of new with. Um, and we are developing, you know, products that they, I bug them all the time. I tell my vendors to bug me, my seed vendors, I bug, I bug my seed. They're like, what do you got? What do you got? What do you got? Look at this, look at this. Because they've seen this every place else. And so, um, I think that we've chosen a lot of right varieties and we still go through that. We just did a whole nother production shift to like, give us like a two regular just variety trial space in the final production. Like that's all it is. Like every week my team has to come with me with like two varieties they want to grow. Go ahead, go do it. Um, and then we keep really good records of that and really good trial sheets that they're in charge of to bring me and say, okay, what do we like? What do we like? But for the breeding aspect, I mean, it's a hot topic. Um, wasn't too long ago that, uh, you know, a couple of big companies announced that they're going to focus on hydroponic and greenhouse breeding varieties. I've had this conversation a long time, going back to when I was working in the fields in California with my, my boss who was a lettuce breeder. And I said, why don't we breed these for this? And we've been talking about that ever since. And because you couldn't, or there wasn't a market. Well, now there is. And we've gone from big seed companies selecting varieties that they know work in hydroponics to finally pushing that over the edge where let's make this work for hydroponics, mm -hmm. right? And I love that. Um, um, we give a lot of feedback. Um, I get regular 
trial sheets for my, my seed suppliers that I have, I owe them, like they're going to send me all this, they, I owe them information. So it's a partnership. And I think everybody knows partnerships work. Um, I'm going to walk down an aisle here and you probably can't see, but we have a couple of tomato grows right there. I don't know if you guys can see that, but yeah. um, we're going to grow those guys on a real typical, you know, on a trail system with a string and a whole nine yards. I can't say that that's profitable, but this whole wall is just for people to see this works with anything, right? Maybe you don't want to make money growing tomatoes, but maybe you have a high school or a neighborhood or community that just needs a hundred pounds of tomatoes. So we're working with that. We're always experimenting. Um, I think I got most of your questions there. <laughs> yeah, a follow-up to that is, um, so, you know, a lot of the conversations around indoor ag in general has been, or for vertical especially, um, is, you know, leafy greens. It works really well, right? And so where do you think, do you think that this plays a larger part in the ecosystem as, you know, yes, it's going to take over some of the leafy greens market, or do you think it's more some of these trials that you're working on are actually have a place here and that it can be a broader application. Um, yeah, no, I think the trials that we're doing, um, we've made our trials more pertinent in the last probably nine months when I really hammered in on my crew and was like, all right, we're going to do this scientifically full scale. Like there's going to be, you tell me what you want or what you think you're going to get. And then you prove me one way or the other way. Lots of, lots and lots of data. Um, lots of pictures, but also get out there and look at things. And so in that process, we found things that definitely win and definitely lose in this system. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean it does that for everybody, but in giving that information to my seed suppliers or even other growers when we, when we cross notes, like that just helps propel the whole idea, right? That just helps everybody out. So, and it's not always a seed variety. Uh, I have seven different kinds of media in here right now, right? <laughs> and so it's like, that's a whole other thing you can talk about in we're constantly testing things and I won't, I won't stop, right? Even if you get it right, doesn't mean you can't do it better. So. Exactly. When you think about the big companies, so you mentioned some of the companies on the seed side who are mm -hmm. now starting to see that there's a big market for this. Do you feel like there's a role for some of the supply chain guys from conventional ag to get, uh, to be involved in indoor ag? Like, do you feel like there's a nice play there together or do you feel like- I think so. I do. And, and this is, a, this is, I have a whole thing on this. <laughs> um, I grew up in Southern Illinois. Um, I was surrounded by corn and soybean my entire life. Um, and that's another discussion, but I worked for, you know, big ag biotech companies at the beginning of my career, two of the biggest. And all the connotations, I learned what a wealth of knowledge and resources and people that are smart and know how to make a difference and care about science and development that's got to help out anybody. And so I think there's a friendly play there. I think there is a benefit to saying, I mean, I'm never going to grow soybeans in this greenhouse. We're never going to grow cotton like this, right? But if I can do this next door and have it all managed together by a farmer, give them options, it opens up a whole other market for everybody, right? So I think, yeah, I do think there's a play there. I don't know how close you are to that. I'm not a business guy like that, but I, it makes sense to me as someone who manages and grows in a greenhouse. Super cool. I just want to remind everybody who's listening in, if you have questions, you can drop them into the Q&A or the chat and we'll happily answer them as they come up. So don't feel like you have to hold on to those. Uh, you can ask them as we go. Um, uh, awesome. So I think one of the other questions I want to dig into a little bit is um, location. So you mentioned this a little bit, sort of the heat, you know, the heat challenges that you guys have in Texas, obviously. This is going to be totally different than a greenhouse in Colorado, in, like then in Montana, then in New York. So how do you think about optimal, um, one, siting, but also to the debate of urban versus rural? Is there, yeah. you know, how does, how does the greenhouse vertical world play into some of this urban rural discussion around ag um, and site mm -hmm. locations? Yeah. Um, and man, I go back and forth on this and I have in most of my career because things keep changing, right? Um, and so, I don't know. I think there's a place for, I like the idea of community pride, community ownership of food production or some involvement. Um, I'm a firm believer that people want to know where their food comes from now and that's not going to change. Mm -hmm. um, so that leads me to say this needs to be urban. Um, but I think the more I thought about it recently is it needs to be, I don't even know what the right term. It's not regional because it's not huge, but it needs to be like this locality. If you want to call local 400 miles or 200 miles or whatever, you know, you don't have to be in an urban area to service that urban area, but also that, that mini region, if you will. 
And so I think there's a in between. And that's kind of a cop out answer, but I do believe that. Like I think that you can service a, a populace that has the same needs and desires within an area. Um, I don't think it matters if it's urban or, or, or rural. I really don't. Um, everyone's needs are different. And uh, yeah, I guess, like I said, it's kind of a cop out, but I, I, I think that's, that's, that's how I stand on that. Although interestingly, I mean, one of the things that you talked about earlier, at least for your system, right, is that there's this profitability benchmark of an acre and a half or so. So yeah. there is somewhat of a limitation there in that you're not going to be sure. in the city, of course, because you're yeah. an acre and a half. <laughs> right. No, and I think people are learning that too. Yeah. I think some of the people who have done that, you see them, I, I don't think there's nearly the urban push anymore that there was, especially not for uh, food scale production, maybe for niche crops or things like that, or a restaurant market or whatever, but I don't think, I don't know, I, I just don't think that we push that envelope a whole lot further anymore. Yeah, and I think one of the things you mentioned that's really important too is the knowledge the knowledge component, right? It's more mm -hmm. that people actually just wanna know where it came from. It doesn't yep. have to be that it came from next door, it's that people want more information. Yep. They wanna know that it's safe, they wanna know that it's standards. I'm curious just your thinking about, I know that you guys aren't sort of the, the consumer side of this, but when you right. think about how how many new people are coming onto this space, but also some of the, you've got like all this marketing cachet around labeling and all these types of things. Yeah. Is there, what's the best way of communicating where your food came from oh, and those yeah. types of things that like, how can farmers really, especially folks that are maybe new and listening, capitalize on those right. types of things? Man, I've been involved in this discussion so many times. <laughs> like I couldn't tell you how many different clam shell design I've seen, you know, throughout oh, my know. career. And, how many times have you fought over discussion. wording? Yeah, right. <laughs> like you can say this, but not that. But let's not say this and let's say that, right? And what rings true? And I mean, my marketing team here is amazing. Um, it's really just one girl, but everybody supports her. Allison's great. But um, you know, we're constantly going back and forth because I have this passion of stop using pesticides as a bad word because people don't understand what a pesticide is, or don't use organic like this, or whatever. But then I have to calm that down and step back and go. But for the time being, this is the public perception of this. So I have to at least ad acknowledge that. So it's a big deal for me to, uh, to be able to educate um, and be honest and, and be progressive at the same time. And, and man, that's tough. But you know, as far as like, we, we've, we've spoken about putting, you know, just different QR codes on our product that you mm -hmm. can scan in the store. This came from this farm harvested by this guy. Here's our profile, that kind of stuff helps. Um, I'm not as in tune as I used to be into what consumers really want, um, but I'm in tune enough to know that, you know, local matters, um, clean matters. I think people would take, um, I don't know. I think if they just knew that it was clean, like safe to eat, especially with the lettuce scare that you get almost annually now, right? And um, part of our sell is that our food safety measures go a little bit above and beyond and, and we like that traceability. So um, hard, hard to put pin on. I don't have the answer for that marketing question right now. Let's, let's talk about the clean, <laughs> clean side a little bit, because I think this is yeah. sometimes, I don't know if you would agree with me, but I would say this is sometimes a misnomer where people maybe four or five years ago would default and say anything grown indoors is by nature safer, which right, is just, I would say a complete misnomer because anywhere where you have people working at all, you have to take the caution, right? And so, right. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, anything, yes, there are ways to control things. There are ways to, to, to do safety measures. How do you think about where some of these regulations are going? I mean, the FDA just sort of passed some new things on traceability the other day. Um, yeah. How do you think about where we're going on clean traceability and some of the things that you guys maybe are doing to, to mm -hmm. get a, ahead of that? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, and uh, we have, we're fortunate enough to have a food safety director here, Raphael, that has been doing this for 30 years and been through all the evolution and is very progressive. Um, we all get more food updates, our food safety updates than we care to get for the day, essentially. But he tells us and we read it and it's good to have a knowledgeable staff. So I think that um, we're being progressive on a record keeper, record keeping and technology side of it, right? We know how to keep our floors clean and our boots clean, uh, wear our PPE, um, make sure we have clean water and do our testing. But conveying that message in a quick way, um, I don't need a recall or sorry, I don't need a mock recall to happen over six days, right? 
And so we've got our mock recall down. Last time we did it here was 15 minutes. And we went from person that bought it to the seed company's lot number and where it was grown. And so well, I have something to ask like that for a been, shout out. Yeah. Was, that, was that using <laughs> Artemis software that you were able It to was use? using <laughs> Artemis software, Allison. Well done. <laughs> I lob that up there for you. No, I no, love it that. Was. I'm hearing I have, what no, you can do for perfect. traceability things is always great. No, it's perfect because it helped. Uh, and it, to be honest with you, it helped make um, our food safety program and some of our execs bigger believers in Artemis because mm -hmm. look at this great tool that it has. And it, it was wonderful for us. But it was so easy because it's right there. It's got to put in the legwork. And so for us, it's um, some blockchain technology that we're looking into that we've been looking into before mm -hmm. that was kind of starting to be mandated. That's a big deal to us. Um, working with our vendors to let them know that you may not be able to do this now, but we're going to start requiring you to do this for us in the future. Like we're going to need to know, like I don't need a three day wait time on a COA or uh, validation of something we need to know immediately. And so I think as the customers, the commercial customers demand that because customers demand that, uh, the vendors and producers are going to start responding a lot better. Yeah, I think that's awesome. And there's sort of like that happy marriage of standard operating procedures plus technology right. gets you to a good place. Um, Absolutely. We've got some more questions. So Rachel, actually, I'm super happy that you asked this question because mm -hmm. Uh, as Aaron's walking around, I'm noticing some yellow cards around the, uh, the, the towers here. <laughs> yeah, so, there we go. <laughs> uh, Rachel's asked a question, is there a natural alternative like a pest or pathogen that would, be, that would protect the plants being produced? Yes. Um, so for the, well, for the last several years of my career, um, I use um, a pretty involved IPM program that surface, surf, uh, what's IPM for anybody who's not, thank you. Sorry. Integrated pest management program. Um, it used to be traditionally it was a pyramid, um, that stacks up to the tip of that pyramid being your chemical approach. And you have to work through all these other steps that make that decision. And in, in a sense, getting you to make sure you're projecting all using all the processes to prevent you from having to spray a chemically synthetic pesticide, right? And so now it's more of a circle. They start coming out with kind of a different model. Mm -hmm. But essentially what we do is we come in and look at the small angles. So culturally, do my people, do my employees, do they understand that they have to clean their feet? Um, do they understand that they can affect pests, that they can bring pests in from anywhere they go? Um, do they know what a pest is? There's a huge educational aspect of this. And I put a lot of time in training my employees to be able to tell me what chlorosis is, to be able to tell me what an aphid is, what a thrips is. Um, so that's, that's the cultural part. But then there's these physical parts. You know, do you have boundaries? Um, are you leaving a window open? You know, is there a door that gets open too much that's right next to a field full of bugs? Um, boundaries and practices and then the, the actual sticky cards that you're seeing, like those are all measures that not only monitor, they help us count and monitor um, and monitor test activity and monitor efficacy of our treatments, um, but they're also a catch, right? Like they're also an acute curative solution for a pest population. So um, yeah, and then we don't use beneficials here right now. Um, we don't need them. I have to not, I have to find some wood. Uh, we don't have a magnitude pest problem <laughs> as of yet. Um, we've been lucky. We um, lucky. I was gonna operate. Say <laughs> yeah, and so we operate, and you know what? I'll, I'll back that up and say, a lot of that has to do with the practices and, and policies that we have in place. Mm -hmm. um, we do have bug screens in all of our openings. There are doors that I will yell at you for if you leave open <laughs> and uh, things like that. Um, and so we take a lot of measures. We do use biological um, applications. We do mm -hmm. use preventative sprays. Um, we use uh, a botanical based um, fungicide. It's not fungi, a botanical based fungal inhibitor. Um, we use um, two natural, um, two natural uh, biocontrols for insect prevention. They are preventative. Um, we use trichoderma um, for our uh, for our root systems. Uh, we, our um, trichoderma mostly right now. So we are constantly using nature's tools to enhance our plant growth and prevent us from having to use anything synthetic or, or dangerous. That's awesome. Um, yeah. There's also another question here, again, back to breeding a little bit. So um, the question is, do you think that your involvement in the way that you structure the, the sort of partnership and, and fee for service kind of a thing with big ag breeding programs, uh, say mm -hmm. corn or soy, would potentially accelerate their breeding cycles in any way? Or do you think they're sort of already as fast as possible? 
I think we accelerate that. Um, and I don't have any super scientific reason for that, except for that. Um, when I was, I, I worked in breeding pipeline trials in California. These are field trials. And they do nine different seasons out there for lettuce, right? It's crazy. And each one of them has a different days to harvest. And part of our deal was getting those varieties we picked in the, in the field to go to seed so we could test that germplasm. And so we were constantly looking for ways to speed that up. Well, I mean, if there's anything that I have learned how not to do, it's make a lettuce plant bolt or go to seed. I could turn that around and do it a lot quicker if I needed to, right? And so um, I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned from this industry because we focus a lot on crop turns and turnaround. And those are the kind of, that kind of evidence is exactly what helps you build a successful breeding program. And so many breeding programs are already utilizing greenhouse technology. I mean, for the most part, because you need to control the, the trials. Do you think that there's an advantage for even just a business model of the way that you guys operate where, where breeding programs could work with third party folks to execute these in a way that's a little bit more high tech or pushing the envelope? And, and I do. Yeah, I'd love to see that come to fruition. I think we're at the very advent of that right now, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. I think now we're starting to turn heads with some big players and people starting to realize that this controlled environment ag industry is here to stay. It is evolving fast and successfully and people are knocking this out of the park and we could really benefit from relationships with big ag um, to benefit everyone. Yeah, I, I agree. And I tend to think that in general, we've sort of maybe passed the hump of so much hyper competition that it's becoming a lot more collaborative, which is always good. I'm going to, I'm not going to hold my breath on that yet. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we'll, we'll wait maybe a few more um, I, I would, I would love for nothing more than that to be true, Allison. Uh, I'm, yeah, I think you should know me as a collaborator. So uh, absolutely. I hope that's sooner than later. <laughs> uh, um, on the software side. So I know like selfishly, uh, you know, plugging here that uh, Aaron yeah. is a customer of Artemis. And so that's what we were talking about a little bit earlier with the traceability yeah. side of things. I'm curious, so we talk a lot about hardware in the space and the different growing systems and the different climate control systems and lighting. We don't actually talk a lot about software. I mean, I talk a lot about <laughs> software, but, we, but yeah. we really don't talk too much about the software side. Where are you most excited about how software can kind of come into an operation and really level up an operation and where do you think maybe again so, sort of similar to the question on hardware where do you think maybe it's a little overhyped or a little bit you know too yeah. too early in the cycle okay so software side the biggest thing i've seen is communication across departments in my company i have a small company but this this is true for anything and i firmly believe that having an, a system like artemis that tracks so many variables that are intangibles that people take for granted that mainly mm. growers tend to use. Um, making that accessible to my CEO, um, my sales guy, my marketing team, um, that's huge. Like before I'd have to call them and explain to them what a crop schedule is and what this is on and what's coming out. Like that is, for anyone who's done it as a grower, you have my sympathy because it is hard to explain that concept to uh, a business model sometimes. And giving people access to that information in a very straightforward and user-friendly interface, um, that's made a huge difference for our staff and our, and our company in general. Um, and people enjoy that. Um, I think it's also improved, it's helped me empower my employees. Um, they wanna be involved and they wanna learn and I'm not about to try to explain the method to my Excel madness to any of them. It would take years, I feel like so. Um, but Artemis lets us do that, right? I can assign something um, I can make somebody in charge of creating batches. Um, I can empower them to own this trial and to enter that data. And that's really been a big, a big help for my team. And where do you think it maybe is a little bit too early in the, in the thinking around software? Um, it's a good question. Um, I still think there's a lot of room. Well, again, we're on the advent of kind of this AI and agriculture thing. And I think, bringing in the hardware aspect, the sensors, um, the greenhouse control systems, um, essentially getting along and communicating with that mm. software, that hardware speaking the same language and not making it, you know, one system for all, letting it integrate. I think that's a big step that we need to take forward. But if I'm talking about, you know, using AI to make plant decisions and really crop modeling on a commercial scale, I don't know that that's there yet at the, level I'd like to implement it, 
I think that's fair. And it's also one of those things where people still have so much value in farming, right? Like I think anybody on this call who's in this, the industry will also say the same thing selfishly because we're all farmers, but uh, you know, there's, there's a complexity in farming because of multiple biological systems coming together that sometimes requires an art form almost to it. And mm. that's where I think you have that lacking of, you know, it's not just science, you know, it is science, but it's not just mm, no. the weather yeah. and the fertilizers <laughs> you put into it. It's, you know, there's still, the crops are not going to behave the way you expect them to behave all the time. They're not. And now, and there, there's a human aspect of this that I will argue don't blue in the face. You can never remove. Um, an example, a personal example I had, um, one of my, my young employees who we hired with the full intent of training them to, to grow and learn indoor ag walked in the greenhouse. She'd been here five months and said, man, it feels a little humid in here. And I said, that's it. That's what I need you to know because you're thinking like a plant now and exactly. not like a person. Like you can tell that it's off. Like I can't teach you that you have to learn that. And it's those kind of things that I don't know that I'm ever able to replace. Right. Yep. Yeah, exactly. We've got another question from David. Um, do you think that indoor grow uh, facilities will follow the efficiency and cost curve to be able to grow more cost effectively versus outdoor grow potentially. So will, you know, mm -hmm. will the alternative of this is will indoor ag always be a premium product or do you think we'll get really cost efficient at scale? No, I think we get cost efficient at scale. I think there's enough um, movement, attention, money movement and players out there now. Um, I think before it was a race to see who could be the standard. Um, and I think that race is a little bit going on, but I think people are, at least I am in my level, get an idea of who the winners and losers are as far as I'm concerned right now. And I don't want to say there's losers, but who's doing a better job for the purpose of scaling to feed people. Um, and then I think um, as those methods come true, it kind of settles down from the, you know, almost on fire pace of development in my method and beat you to this. Now it's like, okay, Let's back up and see what we've learned. And maybe, maybe you still build, you know, a, a 80 acre tomato greenhouse because that's what it's going to take. Right. And so there's nothing wrong with that. Um, or maybe 15 acres of lettuce is what it's going to take to feed a third of the country. I don't know, but I think there's definitely a place for that. It's definitely going to scale. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, so we're running up on time, actually, which oh, went wow, very great. quickly. I know. I, we yeah. could, we were joking great? About, yeah, I could, I could do this all day. We could talk, yeah, we were joking that we could do this all day. Um, right. we'll take, I'll leave the quick Q&A open and, and maybe take one, one or two more questions. Uh, sure. And then as we're sort of wrapping up or waiting for folks to type in those questions, uh, mm -hmm. maybe you can just tell us something that you're really excited about in this ah. industry in particular. Like, what's, what's something that you're just psyched about? Oh, good question, Allison. You caught me off the side. <laughs> you shouldn't have, but you did. Um, I, you know, the, bre the, the breeding thing excites me because I've been close to it for a while. I think that's a big deal. But what really excites me is I think I'm getting a notion that the general public is really starting to accept this. Mm. Um, and I believe that. I do. I may be counting my eggs before they hatch, but I've been doing this for a while. I've been making converts out of friends and family. I've been educating the best I can, trying to do things like this and like you do, right? Um, and get out there. And I really think that movement's starting to change. I think if you ever have to have a, a silver lining of the pandemic we're dealing with now, I think that's part of it. I think people realizing food security, clean food, local food, food chains, um, you know, supply chains, um, and I think I really just get excited thinking that people are finally going to support this movement of controlled environment ag being a main source of the food that they eat. Yeah, it's funny because if you think about 15 years, I guess 10 years ago, I'd say the venture <laughs> sort of came into indoor mm -hmm. ag, right? 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so, yep. you know, prior to that, any, the, the word hydroponic always just had such a negative connotation, right? It was always, yeah, you, were, your, you were talking about either growing weed. pot, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which again, like, or, or isn't, something isn't yeah, negative isn't, anymore, but. Yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> um, or loss of flavor, right? For years, it was an and argument loss, that a tomato yeah. didn't taste that way, right? Or texture or something. We fixed that. And I, I can vouch for that here. I had, I had some people come in and tour today and the, that lettuce is crispy and it's fresh and it's delicious. And I think people can go to a local greenhouse or any place they can, if they can get their hands on it, 
it tastes better. It just does. I'm sorry. It's fresher. It's crisper. And it's better. You may not have ever had lettuce as it's meant to be tasted. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's just funny that the terminology, I mean, again, it's like from going from like basement growing weed or no flavor, cardboard tomatoes, right? Everybody, cardboard right. tomatoes. To now where people are like, well, cannabis is an entire industry now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and it's right. got craft cannabis. You've got right, tomatoes that exactly. taste great. You've got lettuce that tastes great. Okay, we want hydroponic technology. We want exactly. this kind of thing. Yep. Yeah. That's the drive of that I think gets me. And that's, it's, it's so underlying, right? Nobody really talks about that a ton, but um, yeah. I'm glad that you brought that up. Cause I, I, I think that is what gets me going right now. Yeah. 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 Good. Last question. Actually, we'll end on this one. Um, so yeah. from Rachel, uh, where should we as listeners, as the industry potentially direct our mm -hmm. energies and research? Um, there are explosions of information, especially in the last few weeks within green forums and festivals and events and all these things. Yeah. So where's a good place for, and maybe at the same time, you can answer where can people find you? Ah, good call. Um, so I am notorious for having 87 tabs open. Um, and one of my browser windows is tabs of just articles <laughs> and, and like new stuff. Yeah. I like to keep a pulse on the new news. Um, I think in the industry, in the greenhouse controlled ag industry, there are several newsletters that come out daily and every other day that can at least point you in really good directions and highlight the cool things that people are doing um, from the general hoard of daily to um, like, uh, man, I'm going to blank now. Help me out. <laughs> uh, there's produce a ton grower. of uh, produce grower, inside grower. Um, yeah, greenhouse vegetable. Mag. There's just a greenhouse mag, greenhouse management. And they, they are industry specific, but it's really a good way to learn about some of the cool things that are going on right now. Um, and they are cool things. Um, yeah. And then other than that, I mean, I bet you at this point in time, people are closer to a hydroponic farm than they think they are, than they know they are. And I would suggest for people to try to find someone local and mm. reach out every place I've ever worked out that's hydroponic or startup venture um, really likes people being interested and they're going to want you to come see and they're going to talk to you. Yeah, that's um, and an we, awesome I mean, yeah, and, and even without the pandemic, uh, you know, we make an effort to have as many tours as we can. We want, we want you to see how great this is, right? And so does everybody else in the industry. I love that. Um, idea. And is there, is there anywhere right. where people can go follow you or get in touch with you guys if they're interested? In um, working with yeah, you? Um, get in touch with me through my Eden Green email. It's Aaron at Eden Green. I'm very open. I love to talk and that's fine. Um, LinkedIn is my best right now. I'm not uh cool enough to be on instagram regularly and i don't tweet a lot so you can find me on on twitter but i don't you won't see anything there so <laughs> that's awesome and i'm sure the i select folks will link some of these um as well if we ask good yeah but good. um thank so you. for anybody listening thank you so much for joining um yes everybody enjoyed the, the walking tour so there's some comments here and so awesome awesome good. can i drop another tag real just yes. look for uh edengreen.com go to our website we are very active on Twitter and Instagram and everything else. So uh, jump on there. My marketing team does a great job. So please check us out there. I'm going to get in trouble if I don't say that. I, well, I was going to say, I saw somebody <laughs> around photos and I was going to say, if you didn't hype your marketing team. Oh, I'd be in trouble. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I please go to our it. website. Yeah, please, please go and check out. Um, all the stuff Allison's got going with Artemis too. So. Yeah, and I was gonna say, you can find me. I'm also super accessible. My email is just acoff at uh, artemisag.com and uh, also on all social channels. So you can connect with us on LinkedIn or go to our website, artemisag.com. Uh, and we're on, I'm on Twitter and Instagram, but I'm also not cool enough to do it regularly. So <laughs> feel free to follow. Right. Awesome, awesome very much. Um, but uh, it was awesome seeing you as always, Erin. And, and thanks to the iSelect team for putting this together. I think it's always great when you can get in front of the industry. And for anyone yeah. listening, please do feel free to reach out if you have other thoughts or questions or want to work with, with either company. And, and we're excited to meet you guys. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, you so, much. so much. Really appreciate Thank your you. time. To all the participants, thanks for joining us. Um, as a reminder, this was recorded, so if you know someone who would want to hear it post facto, uh, please let them know. They can uh, register on agrifoodconversations.com. And uh, next month's theme will be nutrient efficiency in ag. Um, so we'll, we're working on some great presentations for you uh, over the course of October. And as always, they will be on Thursdays at 3 p.m. Central. So thanks, Allison. Thanks, Aaron. Really appreciate it. Great job. Um, great conversation. Thank and, and thanks to all of our uh, listeners as well. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Have a good one.